Well, I'm looking forward to spending a few moments to share with you some of my thoughts on the evaluation of prosthetic mitral valves. I have no relevant financial relationships with which to disclose. So we begin with a 55 year old woman. She's had three previous mitral valve replacements. The most recent was in 1999 where she had a carbometrics valve placed. She is now NYHA functionally class two and has increasing right ventricular systolic pressures. Here's the initial echocardiogram, parasternal long axis view, where you can see the chamber dimensions here. The ejection fraction was reported at 53%, with an estimated right ventricular systolic pressure of 58 millimeters of mercury. Here from an apical transducer position, left ventricle, left atrium, color Doppler. Here is a spectral Doppler profile, continuous wave through the mitral prosthesis. And what we can appreciate is the peak E wave velocity is 2.4 meters per second. The mean gradient was calculated at nine millimeters of mercury. And here are some of the Doppler parameters that we use to evaluate prosthetic mitral valve function. And we do generally begin by looking at the peak velocity and the mean gradient. In this particular instance, the peak velocity was 2.4 meters per second. The mean gradient was nine millimeters of mercury. It would suggest possible prosthetic valve obstruction. What we should appreciate is that when we see an elevated peak E wave velocity and or increase in mean gradient across the mitral prosthesis, this just suggests that there may be something abnormal or wrong with the valve. It could be pathologically stenotic due to thrombus, panis, thrombus, panis, or degeneration. It could be functional stenosis due to high flow or tachycardia or prosthesis patient mismatch. Or it could be due to significant regurgitation. Increased flow volume across the valve will increase the peak E wave velocity and mean gradients as well. So when we go back to looking at these Doppler parameters, the increase in the peak E wave velocity and mean gradients primarily suggest there may be something wrong with the valve. We need to look at other parameters to help us to discern whether there's a regurgitant problem or an obstruction problem or a functional stenosis problem. We often begin by looking at this TVI ratio, which is the ratio of the TVI through the prosthetic mitral valve to the LVOT TVI. So the mitral prosthetic ratio is the TVI across the mitral prosthesis divided by the TVI through the LVOT, reminding ourselves that this is distinctly the opposite in terms of the TVI ratio we talk about with aortic prosthesis, where the numerator is the LVOT TVI and the denominator is the prosthesis through the prosthetic valve. So the mitral prosthesis TVI ratio is the TVI through the mitral prosthesis divided by that of the LVOT. So as we go back and look at this table of Doppler parameters to evaluate prosthetic mitral valve function, and specifically looking at this TVI ratio, we recall that flow is really the product of area times TVI. So if the TVI is increased, it could be due to the fact that there is a given flow and a decrease in valve area, so an obstructed valve, or the TVI could be increased because the valve area is fine, but there's just an increase in flow. So therefore, we'd have to look at other parameters. And here we look at things like the effective orifice area and the pressure halftime. So we're reminded that the pressure halftime is derived from this deceleration slope of the E wave and that the pressure halftime isn't the velocity halftime, it's the pressure halftime. So it's about 0.29 times the deceleration time. Now, if the pressure halftime is prolonged, say over 130 milliseconds, that would highly suggest pathologic stenosis. If on the other hand, the pressure halftime is less than 130 milliseconds, it could be due to pathologic regurgitation, functional stenosis, or perhaps a normal valve. So for example, here we see two individuals, both with a 29 millimeter porcine mitral prosthesis. They both have the same E wave velocity and mean gradient. On the left, the pressure half time here is prolonged, 139 milliseconds. That would suggest pathologic stenosis, 
E-wave velocity is increased over about 1.9 meters per second. Mean gradient here is about nine, but the pressure halftime is prolonged, now suggesting pathologic stenosis. On the right, same E-wave velocity, same mean gradient, but here the pressure halftime is shorter. It's less than 130 milliseconds. In fact, it's 51 milliseconds. So why is the E-wave velocity increased here? And why is the mean gradient increased? So there's two possibilities here. It could be due to functional stenosis, or it can be due to significant regurgitation, whether prosthetic or periprosthetic. So we'd have to look at other Doppler parameters. And we generally begin by looking at this TVI ratio. The TVI ratio here was two and frequently used a dichotomous cut point of less than around 2.2. So it's low. And that would go against significant regurgitation because if there was increased flow volume across the valve that you would anticipate in relation to what's coming through the LVOT, you would expect the TVI ratio to be elevated. So that leaves us with the issues of functional stenosis, high flow, tachycardia, prosthesis, patient mismatch. So we are left with the concept that this is functional stenosis. So in order to delve through this, we need to look at another parameter, and this is the indexed effective orifice area, here measured at 0.73 centimeters squared per meter squared, which would suggest prosthesis patient mismatch. Moderate prosthesis patient mismatch in the mitral position, less than 1.2 centimeters squared per meter squared. Severe is less than 0.9 centimeters squared per meter squared. So if we go back to our patient, high E-wave velocity, increased mean gradient, suggests there may be something wrong with the valve. We look at the pressure half time. The pressure half time is short, less than about 130 milliseconds. So then we look at the TVI ratio. TVI ratio is increased. It's over about 2.2. This together would suggest the possibility of pathologic regurgitation. Put into this flow diagram, we often begin by looking at the pressure half time. The pressure half time here was short, less than 130, 115. The TVI ratio was greater than 2.2. It measured 2.3. This would suggest pathologic regurgitation. Patient went on to have a TEE. And here you can see this perivalvular jet of regurgitation. Recall, we did not see this on the transthoracic imaging because here the left atrium is in the far field and the sound waves cannot pass through the, the prosthetic material. And so it's shielding the color Doppler in the left atrium. TEE, this left atrium is in the near field and we're able to nicely appreciate significant jet of perivalvular regurgitation. This patient went on to have a plug of their perivalvular jet of regurgitation. So in summary, for pathologic regurgitation, the increase in E-wave velocity over about 1.9 meters per second, the increase in mean gradient over about five millimeters of mercury suggests there may be something wrong with the valve. The short pressure half time, less than 130, would suggest it's not pathologically obstructed. And the increased TVI ratio suggests there's more flow across the mitral valve than what's going, as you would suspect, through the LVOT, now suggesting pathologic regurgitation. How about this 30-year-old woman, status post St. Jude MVR, transferred to our hospital in cardiogenic shock. So here's the transthoracic echo, parasternal long axis view. You can see that the left ventricle is underfilled. The right ventricle is hurting. It's quite dilated and dysfunctional. On the right, we can see the color Doppler uh, through the valve. We begin the evaluation then uh, hemodynamically with the spectral Doppler continuous wave through the mitral prosthesis. You can see a rocket E-wave velocity of 3.5 meters per second, a mean gradient here of 40 millimeters of mercury. I would just say the pressure half time seems to go on forever. And so this individual would be suggested to have significant stenosis, right? High E-wave velocity and mean gradient, high TVI ratio, true, that would suggest either pathologic stenosis or regurgitation. And then, therefore, we look at the pressure half time, which is prolonged, all pointing us in the direction of mechanical prosthetic obstruction. Again, if we were to use this algorithm, 
The increased D-wave velocity and mean gradient suggest something may be abnormal. The prolonged pressure halftime greater than 130 milliseconds, here it was 255, with the high mean gradient would just suggest, again, pathologic obstruction in an individual with normal flow. Here are some of the TE images. This is a color compare. On the left, we can see that the occluders are not moving well. On the right, with color Doppler, we don't see much in the way of mitral regurgitation. Here, zoomed up on the valve itself, we can see this amorphous echo density, somewhat adherent to the occluders. On the left here, a more mobile echo density. Here is the 3D TEE from the left atrial perspective. That's this amorphous echo density we were seeing, somewhat adherent to the occluders, literally sticking them together. This then would suggest mechanical valve thrombosis. And here are the guidelines helping us to understand how we should address the evaluation and management of these patients. So in patients with suspected mechanical prosthetic valve thrombosis, Urgent evaluation with transthoracic, transesophageal echo, fluoroscopy, and or multi-detector CT imaging is really indicated now to assess the valve function, leaflet motion, and the presence and extent of thrombus. We generally begin with a transthoracic echo to evaluate the hemodynamic severity. In the past, the guidelines gave CT and fluoroscopy a class 2A indication. The current guidelines give it a class 1 indication to, again, better evaluate valve motion. If you have a left-sided thrombosis, we then generally proceed with TEE. This then can help us to better evaluate valve function, its hemodynamic impact, and to assess the presence and extent of valve thrombosis. If the patient had class 3-4 symptoms, in the past, the recommendation was for emergency surgery. Today, it's really any symptoms of valve obstruction that there are two options either emergency surgery or low-dose continuous infusion of thrombolytic therapy. Both are effective, and the decision to proceed with either is really based on multiple clinical factors and local experience and expertise. The TE also was used to evaluate whether there was a large thrombus burden, somewhat arbitrarily defined as greater than 0.8 centimeters squared, and if there was much mobility. In these situations, in the past, the guidelines gave a class one indication for surgery. Now, again, two options, either emergency surgery or slow infusion fibrolytic therapy. Patients with more recent onset symptoms, class one or two, small thrombus burden, the fibrolytic therapy is reasonable if there's persistent valve thrombosis after an effort to try to address this with simply IV heparin. As mentioned, there are a number of uh, clinical factors that can be used to help support the shared decision-making of surgery versus fibrolytic therapy. I think important ones to consider are things such as a large mobile clot burden, patients that are hemodynamically unstable or with class four symptoms. But again, it is there are just some factors that can be used to help in the shared decision-making process. Our patient went on to have valve replacement. Here it had a 27-29 onyx valve. How about this 84-year-old woman? She had a bioprosthetic mitral valve replacement in 2012, was NYHA functionally class one, now it, it, it accelerated to class three in the past three months. Symptoms are that of shortness of breath. Here we see the TEE. And you can appreciate that maybe this cusp isn't moving very well. Here we see on the, on the right, color Doppler, we see flow acceleration through the valve prosthesis. To the right, the spectral Doppler up profile showing us that the mean gradient here is 10 millimeters of mercury with a peak E wave velocity of certainly over 1.9, about 2.3 or 2.4 meters per second. The pressure half time is prolonged at 141 milliseconds. So we go to our algorithm, big mean gradient E-wave velocity, pressure half time here is more than 130 milliseconds. That would suggest here pathologic obstruction with normal flow because the mean gradient is over about eight millimeters of mercury. So here we see the TEE 3D from the left atrial perspective, this amorphous material adherent to the cusps as well as to the sewing ring.
blood cultures were negative, and this would suggest not mechanical valve thrombosis, but more bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. So what would you recommend? Redo surgery, valve in valve mitral replacement, thrombolytic therapy, or anticoagulation with warfarin? And the answer really is for these patients that we would proceed to warfarin therapy. This is the issue then of not mechanical, but rather bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. What is the prevalence of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis? This is just a study looking at 397 consecutive bioprosthetic valves that were explanted. And you can see that the prevalence of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis is around 10 to 12% and that there's no significant variance based on valve position. So if we now look at the incidence of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis, remember this is the proportion or rate of people who will develop this during a time period based on the total number of bioprosthetic valves implanted during the study period, some 6,178 gave an incidence of about 0.74%. However, if you only looked at those individuals that actually had follow-up echoes, some 3,100 or so, the incidence was now about 1.5%. In either case, this likely does underestimate the true incidence, as this really only reflects those who have had valves explanted and would not include those who were successfully treated right, with anticoagulation therapy. So the overall prevalence is around 10 to 12% with an incidence of around one to 2%. Now the guidelines clearly recognize that bioprosthetic valve thrombosis can occur and had recommended anticoagulation for the first three to six months post implantation, particularly in patients with low risk of bleeding. Now, if you had a valve placed in the mitral position in the past, Coumadin, target INR of 2.5 for the first three months followed by long-term aspirin therapy. The guidelines now suggest for the first three to six months as a class two indication. In the past, if you had a bioprosthetic valve placed in the aortic position, it was a class two B indication for Coumadin for the first three months with the target INR of 2.5. But today they don't differentiate whether you have a bioprosthetic mitral or aortic valve replacement. Coumadin, three to six months, target INR of 2.5, followed by long-term antiplatelet therapy. Transcatheter aortic valve replacement, dual antiplatelet therapy for the first three to six months, or Coumadin with a target INR of 2.5 for the first three to six months, both class 2B indications. So the ACCHA guidelines that we just reviewed recommend anticoagulation for just the first three to six months after implantation, making one believe that the risk for bioprosthetic valve thrombosis after the first three to six months is very small. But what we see here, in fact, is that the total cases of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis are highest in that year two, from 13 to 24 months. So then what should be the follow-up recommendations for echo following a bioprosthetic valve implant? The guidelines had suggested an initial transthoracic echo to assess valve hemodynamics, in essence, fingerprint the valve hemodynamics after it's been inserted, and then to repeat the transthoracic echo in patients where there's a change in clinical symptoms or signs suggestive of valve dysfunction, and then annual transthoracic echo is reasonable following bioprosthetic valve implantation after the first 10 years, even in the absence of a change in clinical status. I might suggest, just from a clinical perspective, that surveillance should be performed at baseline year one and at least year two, as that, that bioprosthetic valve thrombosis most commonly seen again in that 13 to 24 month time frame. As we discussed earlier, similar to prevalence, the timing of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis does not seem to vary significantly by prosthesis position. And then if you look at analysis of matched cases of structural valve failure, show that the time of explantation for structural valve failure was significantly later, regardless again of position. So that if we see an individual with bioprosthetic valve dysfunction within the first five years or so of implant, you should have a high index of suspicion for bioprosthetic valve thrombosis and meticulous evaluation for such. So how then do we begin to identify bioprosthetic valve thrombosis? 
These are the VARC-3 criteria, the Valve Academic Research Consortium criteria. I put that in quotes because what you see here in light blue aren't specifically from the VARC, but really some of the things we were talking about. So we begin by looking at an increase in the E-wave velocity and an increase in the mean gradient, suggesting that there might be something wrong with the valve. So an increase from that fingerprinted valve hemodynamics we got following implantation. A prolonged pressure halftime, suggesting there may be valve obstruction and a decreased uh, orifice area. Then to look at things like hypoattenuated leaflet thickening or HALT, this generally by CT where you see increased thickness and or layered thrombus seen on a cusp, most commonly on the downstream side, plus or minus reduced leaflet motion or realm. So this reduced leaflet motion shows decreased cusp mobility by CT or TEE. And they begin to quantify this as non-significant if it's a less than 50% reduction, significant if greater than or equal to 50% reduction in leaflet motion could be immobile. And then if you have HALT, plus realm, that would then equal hyperattenuated leaflet motion or leaflet uh, thrombus, which can either be clinical or subclinical. So patients with bioprosthetic valve thrombosis, the initial treatment is generally vitamin K antagonists or Coumadin therapy. What this graph shows us is that those that either receive Coumadin or non-Coumadin therapies, meaning either surgery or thrombolysis, the treatment resulted in similar reductions in gradient. This asterisk just reminding us that this graph here is showing valves in the mitral position, but treatment resulted in similar changes in gradients for each bioprosthetic valve position. Now here was our patient six weeks later having received Coumadin therapy. This is the TEE from the left atrial perspective. And you can appreciate that that amorphous material that was adherent to the cusps and to the sewing ring has mostly resolved and there's good leaflet motion. The mean gradient here now is four millimeters of mercury at a heart rate of 73 beats per minute. How long should a patient be on anticoagulation therapy? That's not really known, but our practice is generally long-term therapy because if they develop bioprosthetic valve thrombosis, then taking them off Coumadin, they're at high risk of developing bioprosthetic valve thrombosis again. Now let's look at this 52-year-old uh, woman. She had a mitral valve repair in 97 for regurgitation, secondary to prolapse. She had a redo repair in 2001, but was now left with stenosis. Now in 2014, she had a mitral valve replacement with a 25 millimeter St. Jude prosthesis and she presents with NYHA class two function and thought to have mitral valve stenosis. Here though is the initial TEE. Here's a image here on the left. We see good occluder motion. On the right, we see nice flow. Uh, in diastole through both the central and two side orifices and not much in the way that we can appreciate of mitral regurgitation. So we begin the hemodynamic evaluation with a continuous wave Doppler profile through the prosthesis. And here you can see this is going through the central slit-like orifice, so likely going to give us the highest velocities and gradients. So we hear, see here that the peak velocity is 2.1 and the mean gradient is eight millimeters of mercury at a heart rate of 66 beats per minute. The pressure half time is 108 uh, milliseconds and the TVI ratio is 1.9. So what can we say about this prosthesis? Normal prosthesis, high flow, pathologic regurgitation or stenosis, normal functioning prosthesis or need more information. And of course, when we say need more information, that's usually the answer. So if we now go back and use this algorithm that we had been looking at earlier, we'd say, yes, the E-wave and mean velocities are a little elevated, which might suggest that there's something wrong with the valve. So we then first look at the pressure half time. It was 108, so it's less than 130 milliseconds that would sort of go against pathologic obstruction. The next thing, we look at the TVI ratio. Here, the TVI ratio was 1.9, which would not suggest pathologic regurgitation, but would put us down this line to the left here. The next thing in the algorithm then is to look at that indexed effective orifice area. And so that's what we need to go on and calculate next. So then how do we calculate the effective orifice area? 
Well, you could say, look, I got the continuous wave through the mitral prosthesis. I know the pressure half time. And so the orifice area would be 220 over the pressure half time. That's 220 over 108, which would give us a valve area of two centimeters squared. This, however, would be invalid or inaccurate because the calculation of effective orifice area from pressure half time was really traditionally applied to those with native mitral stenosis and isn't really valid in prosthetic bowels because of its dependence on LV and LA compliance along with initial LA pressure. So the calculation of effective orifice area of prosthetic mitral valves really should be done with the continuity equation reminding ourselves that the effective orifice area is the stroke volume, so the area of the LVOT multiplied by LVOT TVI, as long as there's no significant MR or AR, divided by the TVI through the mitral prosthesis. So that would be here 69 centimeters cubed divided by 51 centimeters, giving us a area of 1.35 centimeters squared. If we know the body surface area, the indexed orifice area is 0.67 centimeters squared per meter squared. Now, please remember, that in bileaflet mechanical prosthesis, again, that smaller central orifice has a higher velocity than the larger outer orifices, which may lead to an underestimation of effective orifice area by continuity equation. So the accuracy actually by continuity equation is a little better for bioprosthetic valves and single tilting mechanical valves than for these bileaflet prostheses. So going back to this algorithm, we now know that the indexed orifice area is quite low. 0.67 centimeters squared per meter squared, which then helps us to realize this patient of ours had prosthesis patient mismatch. Again, the TE showed normal occluder function, no significant regurgitation. So the manufactured orifice area was 1.35 centimeters squared. That's exactly what we measured, but it was just too small a valve for that patient's size. Now, this concept of patient prosthesis mismatch really considered to be present when the effective prosthetic valve area after insertion into a patient is less than that of sort of their normal human valve. In the mitral position, indexed less than 1.2 centimeters squared per meter squared moderate prosthesis patient mismatch, less than 0.9 centimeters squared per meter squared severe patient prosthesis mismatch. So the consequences of such in the mitral position would be persistent pulmonary hypertension, poor exercise tolerance, and even worsened loss. This just here showing us that patients that have severe patient prosthesis mismatch have a worse survival than those that do not have prosthesis patient mismatch or moderate prosthesis patient mismatch. Strategies to avoid this, either in the aortic or mitral position, if you take the body surface area, you multiply it by that sort of lower level of here, moderate patient prosthesis mismatch, and make sure you take that and compare it to reference values of the effective orifice area for the prosthesis being considered for implantation. Let's look at this 75-year-old woman, rheumatic heart disease, had a bioprosthetic mitral aortic valve replacement in 2010. She has progressive decline in her function over the past two years, now functionally class three, persistent iron deficiency anemia, having intermittent packed red blood cell transfusions over the past number of months. Here's the parasternal long axis view. Here we can see the mitral prosthesis, aortic prosthesis. Color Doppler here across the mitral prosthesis. Here the apical view, left ventricle, left atrium. Here we see on the right, color Doppler. Looking at the mitral prosthesis, we begin with that continuous wave Doppler profile through the prosthesis. Peak E-wave velocity, more than 1.9, 2.6. The mean gradient here calculates also at nine millimeters of mercury. The pressure half time calculated at 120 milliseconds with a TVI ratio of 3.1. We go to this algorithm. Big E-way velocity, high mean gradient, suggests there may be something wrong with the valve. Here, the pressure half time less than 130 milliseconds would not suggest significant pathologic obstruction, but the high TVI ratio of 3.1 would suggest more pathologic regurgitation. If we zoom here on this valve, we don't see much mitral regurgitation, but we see here this very entrained color jet, which might suggest a very eccentric jet that we're not able to pick up in this view. This patient went on to have a TEE, 
and you can see that there's disrupted component of this cusp here. We'll zoom up. It feels like that cusp is actually pulling away from the from the from the sewing ring. And color Doppler here we don't really see the jet, but we can see a large a flow convergence. And with just further angulation, we can see this very eccentric jet of mitral regurgitation. So here's a 32-year-old woman, Lois Dietz syndrome, in August of 2017, had a mechanical aortic valve replacement and a mitral valve repair. Mitral valve repair didn't work so well, and a few months later, ended up having a mechanical mitral valve replacement. She's now got iron deficiency anemia. Here is a TEE, looks like pretty good occluder motion. Here in this view, color Doppler looks pretty reasonable. No significant regurgitation. We come here, we can see the peak velocity 1.9, mean gradient 5 millimeters of mercury, pressure half times 85 milliseconds. The TVI ratio, however, is 2.3. What can we say about this prosthesis? Normal with high flow, pathologic regurgitation obstruction, fun normal functioning prosthesis, uh, or prosthesis or patient prosthesis mismatch. So again, if we go back to this algorithm, the high UA velocity and mean gradient give us a suspicion there may be something wrong with the valve. The short pressure half time sort of negates pathologic obstruction, but now we look at the TVI ratio, which is 2.3. And this elevated TVI ratio might suggest pathologic regurgitation. We didn't really see that, at least in that one view on the 2D image. Now, because the Doppler profile from the transthoracic echo might have suggested pathologic regurgitation, we went on to do a TEE. And here is the 3D image from the left atrial perspective, which shows good occluder motion. And in this modality, we can adjust the light source, which can be very helpful. So what I've done here is I've taken that opportunity to adjust the light source and pushed it from the LA side and into the LV. And in doing so, you can begin to perhaps appreciate around uh, one or two o'clock that there's some light shining through around the sewing ring. Might suggest there's a slight area of dehiscence at that point. Color Doppler now actually shows at that point there is a perivalvular jet of regurgitation. And in fact, there's another jet noted over here. So I leave you again finally with this thought that the evaluation of the mitral prosthesis really begins by looking at that peak E-way velocity and mean gradient. This, when elevated, may signal that something may be wrong. We then need to look at other Doppler profiles, pressure half time, the TVI ratio, and the indexed orifice area to help us differentiate whether there's pathologic regurgitation, pathologic obstruction, or functional obstruction, prosthesis patient mismatch, tachycardia, high flow, and so forth. I hope I was able to give you a practical approach to the evaluation of mitral prostheses. I really thank you very much for your time and attention. And if you're going on to write the board exams, I really do wish you the very best of luck.